I try to do most of my work through projects, is that they kind of see the whole thing, the process and the content. I, I guess it works. I teach science, obviously, and I guess as I've developed ideas kind of in the background, the big picture, I think because it's science, I kind of have like three goals. I want to make it fun, okay? Uh, I think I'm lucky that I get to teach science because to me science is fun and I try to make it so others think that too. I guess the second thing I like to do, especially in environmental science, is make it relevant. Okay, so make it something that's real world, something that if you learn something in class, you might see it the next day or the next week or something. You can make some connections. I guess the final objective I have when I develop a curriculum and my key to learning is having a kid come away with a sense that what I learned today I could actually like do for a living or I can actually you know, uh, do something for somebody with, with this kind of knowledge. There's, there's a point to it. Service learning, that's a tough one. I don't really design my stuff towards service learning. I think it's, it's a nice goal, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an advanced goal. My, what I really like, the, the, I guess the word I like better is applied learning. And I think service learning is a kind of a specialized piece of the broader applied learning. So applied learning is, like I said, I'm going to take something and someone could actually use it, or I can apply it. Uh, the service learning would come, I think, where I could apply it to somebody outside the KIS walls or outside the campus where somebody else might want that kind of information and they could either pay me to, as a consultant to provide them that information or I could offer it to them as a courtesy. Um, but taking, I, I think the service piece comes when you, you apply it to somebody else like a company or to a community or to a person on the river, you can apply you know, those types of things. So the K Water project would be a great example of that. That's where we really have taken our work off campus. Back in 2015, at the end of the year, Mr. Cathers and Ms. Quirin and Mr. O'Connor had these contacts with this, of course this is the Korean water utility, they own all the drinking water in South Korea. They want to partner with a school and we said sure. So we went out and developed an approach to them where we could bring kids to their reservoirs, to some of their villages, and actually apply some of the chemistry and environmental science that we do here in the tanshin and in the classroom and actually bring it out to some of their, their places. So we developed this partnership with them where they essentially they allow us access to their protected reservoirs. That's, that's their drinking water. So we can get to go out on their, on their reservoirs and do water chemistry and water quality and do some microinvertebrate analyses and kind of see what the, what the quality of the water is. And so being able to apply that and understanding that like the village that we stay in could be adding nutrients to this water because of their farming practices, we've got to tie into, you know, we need to do these kind of studies to protect our water supply. So that's been a great applied learning, experiential learning um, process. And the service piece comes in where we're helping the village a little bit understand, you know, what their impacts could be on a drinking water supply. So it's, it's really got a lot of the elements. And the, sometimes the difficult part is, um, you know, getting the language barriers right. So it's really nice to see the kids kind of have to take over, the students kind of have to take over and do a lot of the presentations and stuff to the village because they just speak Korean. Um, so that, that's kind of fun for me to watch where, you know, they can't have me with all the answers anymore, the kids have to have the answers and it really puts them on the spot and they, you know, make them feel good so it's, they, they, they learn something. Can you do mud watts on the CD? Okay. So they're literally mud watts. You went out and filled these with just mud from outside. Mm -hmm. And do you know the process yet? I know you're tinkering, you're so excited about the electronics. Do you know how it works yet? It is magic. It really is magic. It's free energy. Ah, the hot spot. That's a... Uh, that's a, it's a neat little place. And again, that had an interesting history and an interesting beginning to it when um, an administrator at the school came to me and said, gee, Mr. Taylor, we have this piece of land next to the building that nobody's using. Could you use it? Could you find a use for it? I said, yeah, I don't turn down an offer like that. So the only thing I said was, well, we're not going to farm because farming is way too 
intensive. And we're not here in the summer when you need it. So let's make a hotspot. And what a hotspot, and the reason we came up with that idea, myself and a couple of the kids in the Greenpeace Club, is that when you're walking in the woods around here, which I do a lot of, you just notice that there aren't a lot of small mammals, not a lot of birds, there's not a lot of even insects by my standards. So it just seemed like being in a big city center like this with all these millions of people that there's just not a good place for animals to do what they need to do. So let's make this little refuge next to the land and let's do some science in it, let's quantify it, let's start counting the bugs, let's start counting the birds, let's plant some trees down there that provide food for the animals, let's build some homes and protections that these animals could use, and let's see what we can do. And so with trail cameras and kids going out and counting, we're kind of seeing more chipmunks, more squirrels, raccoons come into the hotspot, deer come into the hotspot, uh, pheasants have come into the hotspot. Um, we'd like to think it's because of us, uh, but that's, that's the kind of thing that we can quantify throughout the years. So the hotspot is really, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proven method in urban centers to take small pieces of land that haven't been urbanized yet and just slowly try to get them to grow. It's really a, a key to success for keeping our environment good is we need these trees and we need these animals to be successful as a, as a civilization, really. So that's the big picture. The little picture is it's a great place to go down and watch some, some mammals you don't always see down there. One of the things they designed was, well, how can we bring animals into this place? What do you think they need? What do animals Food. want? Food. Food. And then, then the second water. most. Water. Water. What's the third most important thing? Food, water. And Shelter. Shelter. Holy moly. Ooh. You got my class already? No. <laughs> ah, the joy of bringing kids outside. That has been an experience for me in Korea. As a general rule, I've found that they resist uh, until they get there. And then, I don't think they admit it, but I think they kind of like it after a while. Um, but there are bugs, and you might get your shoes a little dirty. But after that, that's over, um, it, it gets to be kind of fun. And so we do get to go down there, and we get to muck around. We count insects. We dig up worms. Of course, worms are big. Um, we get to see the birds. There was a nesting pair of uh, birds we had down there. There was a squirrel with its kids. I don't know what you call squirrel kids. Um, but they were nesting in one of our houses down there this year, so we got to see them. So it's just fun to see those, those kinds of things. What, what I really like the best is in the last two years, and especially um, at the end of school, is that the groups that are left, the juniors that are left after the AP exams, we will go down and kind of run a field trip for some of the elementary school classes. And last week we did a second, we took a second grade class out to go hunt for bugs. And then last year we took a fourth grade class out a couple of times. And that's just fun to see the big kids and the little kids, they kind of partner up and they go dig for, dig for, for things. Expand, get rid of or change, environmental science. Hmm, funny, I have an opinion on that. What I would love to expand, and this is just, this, if it's a passion, then call it that, would be the research piece of environmental science. Getting kids, and I think kids are getting more and more attuned to this, and I know colleges love this kind of stuff, is having independent projects where kids go out and collect their own data, and they analyze it, and they come up with some sort of conclusion or analysis um, based on research. So that would be one thing I'd love to see. And, I, and in fact, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. What I'd like to maybe diminish would be the, the kind of the AP model where it's content, you know, read this chapter and know all the words in it. Um, I'm much bigger on the process rather than the content to understanding how to go out and analyze if something is contaminated or not um, is more important than saying, well, I know mercury is something that will affect your neurological system. I mean, that's good to know, but I want to know how do I measure it? How do I know if it's even there? So the process, I think, is more important. Um, and those kind of things I'd love to see.